kind of delving a little bit into the theory behind what I believe Tantra to be. Um, there's a number of videos prior to this, which, you know, all in this series of Atheism versus India Revisited, section 10, I guess we'll call it, basically all my views on Tantra so far. Um, all kinds of strange esoteric stuff that really isn't that strange once you look into it, or if you strip it of all the occult stuff. Um, that's what I think Tantra is, or that's what Tantra could be interpreted as, I'll put it that way. There's no one definition as to what Tantra is. I see it as a deliberate attempt to manipulate experience from the inside, from the first person's perspective. Okay, so we want to manipulate our experiences. Why do we want to do that? <laughs> Why would anyone want to do that? Well, um, B. Quimby kind of zeroed right in on it in the comment section to the previous video. How do we incentivize someone to actually engage in Tantra? Or to engage in any kind of, I guess, introspection or withdrawal into oneself in order to be aware of the perspective from, w from which one views everything um, and to alter the nature or to influence the nature of one's experiences. Why would one do any of this? What are you looking for? That's a very good question. Um, and it goes back to my suggestion that we can talk about the horrible stuff it's fairly straightforward, you know, um, Auschwitz, Hitler, uh, Khmer Rouge, Pol Pot, anthrax, the bubonic plague, famine, all this stuff. We all know what the bad stuff is. Um, you can get graphic and, you know, all that, but you don't need a huge amount of imagination to deal with that which is negative. <laughs> um, what is an actual positive? We're so used to, in our utilitarian way, um, dealing with the elimination of negatives that defining what a positive actually is is something we may have actually gotten a little bit sloppy at in the West. Um, we like to solve problems. We like to overcome obstacles. We like to perform projects. Um, these are all designed generally to um, solve a problem, <laughs> a problem that exists. In other words, we're trying to overcome an obstacle that is already there. What if there's no obstacles? Is there then an incentive to do anything? Um, I don't think that it's absolutely essential that anyone ever embrace Tantra or attempt to get into it or attempt to engage in experiential type of conscious exercises or whatever you want to call it. There's no need for this. You, we won't die if we won't do it, so why bother doing it? Well, <clears throat> I would say we're going to have to reevaluate our view of um, experiential states um, because we think that we've nailed it, but we haven't, in my honest opinion. Um, if you, say, compare the um, things that people actually refer to when they talk about experiential states, it's generally about either a negative or an absence of a negative. How about a positive? Um, Schopenhauer says the absence of negative is essentially what it is. In other words, we, we, just, we want to live simply because we want to live, and that's it, that we're, we wish to survive. Um, Nietzsche, of course, would say, no, we want to survive, but we want to survive in order to uh, indulge, I guess, our will to power. Um, the tantrics would kind of agree, because that's one of the things about tantra, is that it deals with power. Temporal power? No. But um, I would say that it deals with power over oneself and over one's own experiences. And again, they sort of if you have power over your experiences in a certain sense, you've controlled the universe, at least the universe as it exists, perceived from one person's first person point of view. Why would you want to do that? 
Um, okay, well, first of all, from a harm reduction point of view, we want to control our experiences to see if we can actually eliminate the bad part from harm. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. That's where the bed of nails comes in and things like this and people that cripple or torture their bodies, these tantric ascetics in India who do that, I think, to this day. Um, okay, so you, you learn how to conquer all the bad sensations. You learn how to, as uh, Herman Hesse said in Siddhartha, you learn how to make your body become silent. You no longer hear your body screaming for attention when you become an adept, when you become aware when you become aware of all the things that are going on in your body you can sort of okay my body is suffering but my body is now in control or my mind is now in control of my body so my body will just have to bloody suffer because my mind says so and my mind is the boss it's not the other way around okay so we have done this we've turned our bodies into isolation tanks now what ah <laughs> that's where the road goes off the map what is a good? What is an enhancement? What is a positive experiential state? Um, how do we go from the negative into the positive, and is there a way for us to stay in the positive, or at least have more in the positive than in the negative? And what does that actually mean, to go from one experiential state to another? Is there, there really Are you really going from one thing to another? No, because the, the point of view is still there. Um, the point of view being you. <laughs> uh, you're not going from one place to another. You're changing fundamentally. Um, so when we perceive out into the world with uh, our will, desire, whatever you want to call it, we perceive things and we pr project our biases onto the world, onto the universe, that which we perceive. Okay, now, what if we projected all of our biases, not so much a positive bias, but we project um, ourselves onto the universe? In other words, we have altered ourselves, and we are now in a positive place. You ever notice that the universe looks so much nicer when you were in a positive place? <laughs> you change yourself, you change the universe. Um... What is the ultimate nature of the universe? Is it a good or a bad place? Well, that depends on who you ask. A person who's in a good place will inhabit a good universe. <laughs> a person who's in a bad place will inhabit a bad universe. Uh, how do we know what place somebody else is in? We don't. This is experience we're referring to, and experience doesn't work like that. <laughs> That's why we do it. <laughs> That's what that's the aim of Tantra, if you ask me. The power to change the universe by changing oneself.